In the early 1990s, America was a place where most members of the LGBTQ plus community had to live in the closet. Although much better than the early 1900s, it was still a far cry from what it is today. There were often news about hate crimes towards both people of color as well as members of the LGBTQ plus community. And let's be honest, not everyone was in support of the community but even those who weren't in support could agree that some actions taken against its members were extreme. Although shocking, it became an often occurrence. But on December 31, 1993, in a small town in Nebraska, a story would unfold that would change the way we think about gender identity and discrimination. This is the tragic case of Brandon Tina, a trans man who unfortunately became a victim of a hate crime. The city of Lincoln, the capital city of the state of Nebraska in the United States. Located in the southeastern part of the state, and the second most populous city in Nebraska is a vibrant and beautiful place. Founded in 1856 and named after President Abraham Lincoln, it is a place with rich history. But, in the 1990s, the LGBTQ plus community in Lincoln, Nebraska, faced a challenging social and cultural landscape. There was limited legal protections, few spaces where members of the community could be themselves in, and a lot of discrimination. It was here, in this city that Brandon Tina was born. He was born Tina Renee Brandon on December 12, 1972, to Joanne Brandon. Eight months before he was born, his father died in a car accident in Lancaster County. He was the second of two children and was raised by his maternal grandmother till the age of three. At the age of three, Brandon and his older sister, Tammy, who was six years old at the time were reclaimed by their mother. The family resided in the Pine Acre Mobile Home Park in Northeast Lincoln. As young children, the two children were sexually abused by their uncle for several years, which was a lot for the girls to handle. Brandon had always been a tomboy from the start and so it came as no shock to people who knew him as a child when he began identifying as male during adolescence. On some occasions, he even identified as intersex. He was described as socially awkward in high school, but that didn't stop him from being known by the entire school. When he was in his second year, he rejected Christianity and staged a protest regarding the Christian view on abstinence and homosexuality. To prove his point, he began dressing in a more masculine way, violating the school's dress code and putting him on the radar of school authorities. In the months before he graduated high school, Brandon changed for the worse. He began skipping school and failing his courses, leading him to be expelled only three days before graduation. In 1991, Brandon began a relationship with a female and his mother didn't approve. Due to this, he soon got a job as a gas station attendant, hoping to save some money to purchase a trailer that would serve as home for himself and his girlfriend. In January of 1992, Brandon Tina was required to undergo psychiatric evaluation. The results concluded that he was experiencing a severe sexual identity crisis and so he was taken to a center to ensure he wasn't suicidal before being released three days later. In 1993, Brandon got into legal trouble and decided to move cities. He moved to Richardson County, Nebraska and soon settled there living in the house of a woman by name Lisa Lambert. In his bid to create a fresh start for himself, he presented himself as a man and even found himself being a member of a friend group, two of whom were ex-convicts. He soon started dating a young lady by name Lana Tisdall and things seemed to be going well for him as he finally had the life he wanted. But never in his wildest dreams did he imagine his lie would blow up in his face, leading to his death. 
On December 19, 1993, Brandon was arrested for forging checks. His girlfriend, 18-year-old Lana Tisdall, was the one who bailed him after getting the money from her father to pay. Lana only got to know Brandon was transgender at this time because he was in the female section of the jail. Brandon Tina's arrest was posted in the local paper under his birth name and thereupon, his acquaintances learned that he was assigned female at birth. At a Christmas Eve party, two people who he thought as his friends cornered him. They were 22-year-old John Lauder and Marvin Thomas Neeson. The two had been in jail for various crimes and were ex-convicts. They forced Brandon to pull his trouser down and confirmed the fact that he had a vulva. When they saw this, they physically assaulted him and then forced him into their car, driving to a deserted place. There, they physically and sexually assaulted him. They threatened to silence him permanently if he said anything to the police. They then forced him back into their car, driving back to Marvin's house, where they forced him to take a shower. Brandon escaped from the bathroom's window and went to his girlfriend's house. He narrated everything that had happened to her and she convinced him to report it to the police. Brandon did just that, before proceeding to the emergency room where a rape kit was administered. Unfortunately, and for whatever reason, the rape kit he had been administered went missing. Now that wasn't the only weird thing about all that was going on. The sheriff in charge of the case, Sheriff Charles Locks, wasn't really sympathetic with Brandon about all he had gone through. Instead, he was much more focused on the fact that Brandon was a transgender male. Brandon felt uncomfortable with some of the questions and felt the sheriff was being rude, and so he refused to answer any more questions about his sexuality. Now before you think Brandon might have been overreacting, keep in mind that this was in the 90s and so it is very possible that the sheriff was actually being rude and not focusing on the core of the matter, Brandon's rape. Authorities refused to make an arrest claiming lack of evidence even though Brandon had narrated everything that had happened to the best of his abilities. John and Marvin found out that Brandon had gone against their instructions and had reported the incident which got them really angry. And so they decided to follow through with their threat of silencing him permanently. At around 1 a.m. on the 31st of December 1993, the two men broke into the home where Brandon was staying. They met the homeowner Lisa Lambert when they entered her room. They asked for Brandon and she told them she hadn't seen him as he hadn't come home. They didn't believe her and started searching the room. They found Brandon hidden under a blanket at the foot of Lisa's bed. They then asked Lisa if there was any other person in the house which she confirmed saying a man by name Philip Devine was also home. Still furious, they shot Brandon in his stomach. When they realized he was still twitching, they brought out a knife and stabbed him multiple times. Marvin then shot Lisa and then the two men proceeded to go find Philip. They found him and brought him back to Lisa's room, making sure he saw the two bodies and then took him to the living room, where they made him sit on the couch before shooting him twice. The two men returned to the room, shot Lisa a few more times, before making their way out of the house, leaving the house with three bodies inside. Lisa's toddler who was eight months old at the time and also in the house was left unharmed and motherless. The two men were arrested that afternoon, both passing the blame on to the other. They confessed that the murder weapons had been thrown into a river. The weapons were soon recovered, placing them at the scene of the murders. In exchange for a lesser sentence, Marvin Neeson admitted to being an accessory to the rape and murder. He was given a life sentence after testifying against John Lauder. John on the other hand although denying Marvin's testimony was found guilty of murder and was sentenced to death. John Lauder has been denied his appeal three times and his conviction still stands. 
The two men are currently rotting behind bars. Joanne Brandon, Brandon's mother, sued the Richardson County and Sheriff Charles for indirectly causing Brandon's death and won the case and was paid a sum of $80,000, not enough if you asked me. A person's life is worth more than that. Brandon Tina didn't deserve to die such a horrible death. None of the victims deserved what they got. Two heartless people caused grief to three families. May their souls continue to rest in peace.